Once a week, the mail for New Zealanders serving in Japan leaves by air from Auckland, and the RNZAF take it over the longest air route in the world. On this trip, a National Film Unit cameraman is going along, and a group of Mosquito ferry pilots will be taken as far as Singapore on their way to England. This is the crew of the aircraft that will do the long flight to Japan. And between them, they've flown in every theater of the war over millions of miles. Here are some extracts from a diary kept by our cameraman on the trip. Some islands off the coast were our last sight of New Zealand as we set course for Norfolk. We refueled there and flew on to Brisbane. We flew high and fast across the great Australian continent, over the route the famous overlanders covered in 1942. It took them months to get over here, but for us it was a matter of a few hours. Sometimes the crew tuned into a radio program. That's Cloncurry, a little town set down in the middle of Australia. We landed and went for a drink in the Oasis Hotel. Don Curry has nine pubs for its population of 1,400, and they're open from early morning till late at night, but it's quite legal. Two RNZAF Dakotas cross here every week, and the local pub keepers do well out of the boys. Rustling cattle is almost an accepted occupation hereabouts. No doubt these blokes have rustled a few in their time. Besides barflies and rustlers, there are also a number of aboriginals in the local population. Once again, we flew high across the Australian desert, hour after hour over the dry, flat land. Down there, the heat's terrific, but up here we drank tea and had a bite of food to keep warm and to relieve the boredom of the flight. After leaving Darwin, we turned onto a westerly course and headed for Surabaya in the Dutch East Indies. Surabaya is hot. It's hot and it's dirty. Beneath the shadow of a huge bank building, street vendors and beggars shelter from the hot afternoon sun. Scrawled on walls are Indonesian slogans. Hands off Indonesia. Colonism's a crime and freedom is our birthright. Dutch forces occupy the city, but there's no running water available for the Indonesians control its source. Political meetings are not encouraged unless they're friendly to the Dutch, like this one representing a minority group calling itself the Pan-Sudanese movement. Surabaya is an armed camp. You'll see military vehicles, barbed wire and troops at every turn. This city's on the edge of war. But it's only a couple of days by air from New Zealand. We left Surabaya and flew on to Singapore. The navigator took sun sights at regular intervals and a mosquito pilot wrote a letter home. That's Singapore. Singapore, the famous gateway to the east. The magnificent buildings of the government administration dominate the seafront but our pilot, navigator and wireless operator prefer to poke round the back streets to see if there are any bargains to be had. In the slums of Singapore, a New Zealand pilot meets a woman from Malaya. The speech and customs are different, but the smiles are friendly. Back at the airfield, an RAF York takes off for England with the Mosquito Ferry pilots. In three days, they'll be in London. Meanwhile, our two flight engineers do a daily inspection of the aircraft's engines. Their work begins as soon as we hit the deck. 140 flights have been completed between New Zealand and Japan without a single accident. That's how good these men are at their job. In the cool early dawn, we taxied out for the takeoff and the course was set for Saigon in French Indochina.
Saigon is a French city and there are plenty of troops about in the streets. They're on leave from fighting the Vietnam forces in the north. The French officers club at Saigon is called the Circle Sportif and boasts one of the most beautiful swimming pools in the world. If you're a French officer or his girlfriend, you can relax from the afternoon heat in these luxurious surroundings. No one works in the afternoon in Saigon. No one, that is, except the native people who are unlucky enough to have been born here. For them, there's no end to toil, to begging in the streets, to snatching at any piece of food found lying around in the marketplace. In French Indochina, food is scarce, prices are high, and there's warfare in the countryside. From French Indochina to British Hong Kong is four and a half hours. Throughout the whole trip, we were constantly in touch by radio, even with stations in Australia and New Zealand. Below lies Hong Kong, one of the world's greatest ports. We landed at a ref field at Kowloon on the Chinese mainland, and then took a ferry boat across to the island of Hong Kong. This is a city of two million people, and they're nearly all Chinese. In Hong Kong, luxury goods are plentiful. You can buy anything from rare silk to fine perfumes, from bottles of Scotch whiskey to any brand of cigarette under the sun. But prices are sky high. The cost of living is about four times more than what it is in New Zealand. There are plenty of people in Hong Kong who have to work long, hard hours just in order to subsist. They eat and sleep in the streets. But the wealthy can afford to relax on the beautiful seaside resort at Repulse Bay, just a few miles from the city. The last leg of the journey took us across the China Sea, through Okinawa and on to Japan. The mountains of Japan are high and uninviting. We flew past smoking volcanoes onto the airstrip at Iwakuni. The New Zealand fighter squadron is based at Iwakuni and the boys are always eager to collect their weekly mail from home. It comes 10,000 miles. Aircraft of the RNZAF's 41 Squadron have been flying this route for 18 months. They've covered a million miles without an accident, and every bag of J-Force mail has reached its destination. In the field of air transport, no record could be better. The bags of mail for home go on as the others come off. It's a quick turnaround, and we set our course for the south. We flew from Iwakuni to Okinawa, then down to Manila, capital of the Philippines Republic. Manila is a crowded city of traffic jams and confusion. The country has recently been granted its independence by the USA, and this is the head of the government, President Rojas, who was installed by General MacArthur. During the war, he served in the Japanese puppet government. The president has good reason to look worried, for ahead of his country lies an immense job of reconstruction and recovery from war. Manila was our last sight of the Far East, and we winged our way homewards down through Moratai to Darwin, across Australia, and over the Tasman until Auckland lay below. This is the end of the journey, the longest trip in the world flown by any single crew or aircraft. 17,000 miles from the bottom of the world to the top and back again. At Fanuapai, there are no greetings, no acclamations. The crew just get off and go over to the mess for a meal. In a few days, they'll be taking off again for the long hop back to Japan. <laughs>